welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. You can tell a lot about where a company is going by looking at where it's been. ConocoPhillips, Alaska's oil and gas company. The National Weather Service. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on the 6th of December. As always, we encourage you to visit our website for the very latest weather information. You can also get similar information in your village and community by using your NOAA weather radio. Make sure it's got some batteries in there. Always a good time to refresh the battery pile. ARH.NOAA.gov is the place to go. Weather.gov will also get you there. If you click on Alaska, that will take you to the nearest weather service office that serves your village and community, Fairbanks, Juneau, and Anchorage, of course. The weather info line at 800-472-0391 is open and ready to serve your needs on Twitter. Twitter.com, go to NWS Anchorage, NWS Fairbanks, or NWS Juno, U.S. National Weather Service Alaska on Facebook and on YouTube. Two ways to get this information. In the middle afternoon, you can get a condensed version of what you'll see here over the next 20 to 30 minutes. And after the show, about 15 to 30 minutes later, go to Alaska Public and you can find the entire broadcast there. Again, on YouTube or if you'd like to search for AKWX TV. Many of you have found that already there. We can uh, see who's viewing that and it's really helpful uh, if you'd like to add your comments. Let us know what you think about that service, whether it's the short version or the long version brought to you by our broadcast partners here at Alaska Public. Here's a look at the hazardous weather information around the state tonight. Freezing rain advisory continues around the middle Tanana Valley, including Fairbanks. Uh, light accumulations of ice are still possible there. That will expire as we head into the early morning hours tomorrow. And a winter storm warning continues from the west coast all the way to the Yukon border. Uh, those will expire from west to east as we go through the morning hours tomorrow. But still, we're looking at uh, accumulating snow in some cases, freezing rain, most of that pretty light. And winter weather advisories continue for the Arctic Slope and uh, parts of the northern Brooks Range Slope there east of Point Hope for accumulating snow and also some light areas of ice. Quite a mess across the interior. One thing we don't see, though, still no warnings for southeast. We've expired the advisories and warnings for south central, even though some light freezing rain and rain is still possible over the weekend, not to mention some areas of fog. So it's still quite a mess across this uh, area and with the uh, very large area of high pressure across most of Alaska and a strong southerly flow up the west coast. Uh, we may see more watches, warnings and advisories as we go through the next couple days. But the main surge of this seems to be coming to an end, at least for the time being. As you look at the Bering Sea satellite picture, once again, we've got a low here across the North Pacific. That is also pushing some moisture up across the Alaska Peninsula, not to mention some very warm weather yesterday. One example would be Cold Bay hit 53 degrees. If that sounds warm, it probably is because it was just one degree shy of the all time December high temperature recorded there in Cold Bay, Alaska. So pretty impressive stuff. Another round of warm air today with temperatures back in the 50s there. Uh, most areas there along the Alaska Peninsula, at least in the upper 40s, maybe lower 50s where you were if you're watching us from uh, the arm there. As you look a little bit farther north, you can see that plume of moisture stretching all the way up over the Seward Peninsula and into the Chukchi Sea. That's also affecting the ice across the Kotzebue Sound and across the Chukchi Sea coast. Well, if you look a little bit further westward, we'll start up the motion here one more time. You can also detect spin in the atmosphere sphere here just south of Anadir and another surge of moisture coming up from the Sea of Japan and Eastern Asia coming into the southern parts of the Kamchatka Peninsula. So once again we're starting up that process with that deep southerly flow, more batches of moisture trying to work their way toward western Alaska and the Bering Sea. Will this have a similar impact in several days? We're going to watch and uh, find out and we will let you know as soon as we think we've got an answer. As you look at southeast though, one thing that's happening with this pat pattern that is forming that upside down U-shaped pattern, that omega blocking pattern that we talk about especially uh, as of the summer when it had such dry impacts across the region. 
or southeast. This is bringing in cold. It's draining out that intense cold from the Yukon. A lot of that has slipped into the lower 48 and you hear all your friends and relatives complaining about how cold and how snowy and you feel so bad for them, right? No, you don't. But across southeast, it is keeping things pretty dry and at times partly to mostly cloudy conditions around some of the northern sections of southeast, but it has uh, kept pretty dry conditions across most parts of the southeastern panhandle for uh, the last several days. That's gradually gradually coming to an end. We're going to start to see some chances of light rainfall, especially across the central parts of southeast uh, with a trough of low pressure weakening there. You'll see relatively light winds over the weekend, but we're going to start to see that chance of some light rain sneak back into your region. In the meantime, high pressure is moving back over across south central. You can see the sky is relatively clear across south central. We're missing some of the lower clouds in this picture here, uh, but what we're going to see is a lot of low clouds developing across the Cook Inlet and south central over the next 24 to 48 hours. So with temperatures hovering around freezing and some light uh, areas of uh, fog developing, perhaps a deepening and uh, thickening a little bit over the weekend. We could have some freezing fog in the area and that will continue to make things slick. If there's even a little bit of drizzle out there, of course, that will continue the part of the uh, that slick road uh, issue that we've got going on around uh, the Matsu valleys and across south central. So something to think about there on top of the persistent area of light rain and freezing rain and snow that is going across the interior at this hour and will continue into tomorrow morning. A lot to think about there. Tonight's weather map then. High pressure across the Yukon and across British Columbia. Look at this, 1,047 millibars. Not the highest we've seen, but this represents deep, strong, cold air across the western parts of Canada. That is entrenched again across the lower terrain of Alaska and it does not want to budge. So what happens? That warm and wet air rides up and over it and as it saturates from the top down, we get that freezing rain. We get freezing drizzle. And of course, when we already have snow on the ground, it makes things very slick. Across the Arctic coast, we have some light snow. Some of that blowing, especially uh, for areas east of Vero out toward Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse, a stationary boundary constricting the flow up there and really tightening up the winds. And across the eastern parts of Russia, east of the Gulf of Anadir. Colder air is trying to build in, trying to work its way into the ridge of high pressure that stretches into the North Pacific, and you can see another surge of warm air trying to lift north out of the Pacific there. So right now we've got dry cold air in the east, warm and wet air in the west, and another surge of colder air building across the eastern sections of Russia. What happens? Well, right now the warm and wet air winds across the west. Try saying that about five times fast. And across the northern parts of the Arctic, freezing rain continues tonight. Some areas of snow showers will develop and probably increase over Fairbanks as we head through your Saturday. For southeast, it might even be a snow shower or two. It should be cold enough for that. And areas of light rain and freezing drizzle still possible across south central on top of the risk of fog developing through your Saturday. The good news is widespread precipitation is not terribly likely for your Saturday. Sure you might see some light rain from time to time or maybe some freezing rain, but by and large it looks like a much drier situation. There's high pressures really trying to stabilize what's going on here across south central. Farther north, freezing rain and probably some freezing drizzle from time to time throughout your Saturday and again an increasing chance for some snow showers across the middle Tanana Valley and parts of Fairbanks. Light rain showers possible across areas in southeast. By and large a dry pattern for most, more clouds than anything else. For the Arctic coast, areas of snow and blowing snow with some fog, Rain showers for parts of the Chukchi Sea coast. It's that warm. And across Bristol Bay, areas of light rainfall. Stabilizing ridge of high pressure there. Looks like more fog for the Bering Sea. And you can see the cold air out in the west not moving very far east at all. It will slowly slide into the western parts of the Bering and perhaps close in on Shemia by Sunday. Some areas of light rain there. The stronger winds continue across the central Aleutians. Storm force winds there across the central islands tonight. Uh, some of that should subside as we get into uh, the weekend there, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, pockets of light rain across coastal sections of southeast with high pressure still in charge there. Look for areas of fog across the Kenai Peninsula, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, and into the Matsu Valleys. Pockets of light snow, perhaps for the central and eastern interior as a cold front slides through western Canada. That will take another surge of colder and drier air southward and should help to uh, reestablish that area of high pressure probably across the interior meaning colder nights are ahead as we head into uh, Monday and Tuesday with pockets of light snow, fog, and flurries for the Arctic coast. That's a look at the weather maps for the next couple days. Here's what happened this afternoon. Teens and 20s for southeast. Wow, is that cold around Juneau 18. Coastal sections also approaching freezing from Sitka down to uh, Petersburg in the inner channels. 20s and 30s out around the Dixon entrance. Haines and Skagway, teens and 20s there. Yakutat down to 30 degrees. Prince William Sound saw readings in the 30s around Homer and Seward, 30s and 40s there. 33 in Kenai, 34 in Anchorage, 42 in uh, Kodiak earlier today up the uh, Parks Highway. Temperatures were at or above freezing, including uh, places around Squintna. 
Healy was 36, Greeley on the other side of the hill at 1524 in Fairbanks, single digit territory for Northway and Eagle. You're usually considerably colder than that. Two below in Fort Yukon, nine, nine above, I should say. See how odd this is? Nine above in Arctic Village. Teens and 20s for the Arctic Coast, 35 around uh, uh, Point Hope there in Wainwright and up toward uh, Barrow is 19 degrees. Contribu Sound in the low to mid 30s. Our apologies, Shishmaref was not reporting again for the second day in a row. 32 in Nome and around Norton Sound. Temps there were in the mid to upper 30s. You got out around Amonic and you saw readings in the upper 30s. Bethel was 47. Nunavak Island 37. Gamble, congratulations on another uh, a bowhead we hear. 30 degrees out there and out around Grayling. Temperatures were hovering in the 30s. Uh, 40s and 50s for Bristol Bay. In fact, uh, King Salmon was 53 degrees, one of the warmest spots in the entire state. Today. 40s and 50s for the Alaskan Peninsula and 40s for the Aleutians with rain and snow in the Pribilovs. I believe St. Paul was looking at uh, rain with St. George looking at snow earlier today. So a very sharp contrast in temperatures there that were making those uh, strange situations possible. 20s and 30s for southeast overnight. 20s and 30s also for south central. Kodiak 38. 22 in Fairbanks. 0 in Fort Yukon. Teens and 20s for the Arctic Coast. 30s for the Seward Peninsula and low to mid 30s for uh, the west. YK Delta in Bristol Bay with 40s uh, for most of the Alaskan Peninsula. 33 in St. Paul with a high of 37 tomorrow for your Saturday in Fairbanks, 32 degrees. Low to mid 30s for South Central. Kodiak also in the lower 30s. Looks like most of Southeast will be in the 20s and 30s with some exceptions along the coast like Sitka at 41. Barrow looking at 27 with Kaktovik at 24. Still some very cold air across the eastern parts of the interior and the Copper River Basin with the majority of the west coast, especially the YK Delta and even interior parts of the Seward Peninsula well above that freezing point. Uh, Selawick and areas around Kotzebue Sound probably looking at very mild weather and rain tomorrow as we go. Here's a look at the situation if you're flying tomorrow. If you're around south central and southeast, chances are you're looking at VFR at least for some part of your day. But if you're south of the Brooks Range out toward the Seward Peninsula, Norton Sound, the YK Delta, Nunavak Island, and the eastern Aleutians, you're looking at IFR conditions and MVFR uh, at least a little bit farther out from that. IFR conditions from Barrow and points eastward as well. Pass conditions then. We expect Anaktuvik Pass to be IFR. The same goes for Adigan Pass through most of your day. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should be VFR, and we're certainly seeing improving conditions conditions around Rainy Pass and Windy Pass for your Saturday. If you've been looking to get through Isabel Pass, chances are you should make that uh, for visibility anyway tomorrow. And Mentasta Pass, visual flight rules should go. And Tanita Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions improving throughout your Saturday, probably early on. Portage Pass, expect VFR by mid to late afternoon. And Chilkoot and White Pass, with high pressure in charge, it still looks to be VFR for the beginning of your Saturday. Freezing levels, once again, every day we look at this chart and say, wow, this is really telling the story of the problems that we're having right now with our hazardous weather across the Great Land. You can see the elevated freezing lines all the way to 2,000 feet to the Arctic coast and 8,000 feet here in the Gulf. This is warm and wet air taking over Alaska, but being undercut by that cold, dry, Arctic air mass sliding into south central over southeast and being pushed northward even into the Chukchi Sea coast and Kotzebue Sound. So that problem, that overrunning is what we call that. That's what's creating that freezing rain issue across a large part of the state. So icing potential if you're flying tomorrow above 6,000 feet for the uh, elevated icing threats there. But at the surface, don't forget, freezing rain and freezing drizzle will be possible. And that represents an isolated, perhaps even occasional severe icing threat. As many of us in South Central found out the other day, even just your car windshield can freeze up like that. Across uh, the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern parts of the Aleutians, above 10,000 feet, probably running into more of an occasional moderate icing potential there. So the threat is certainly upon us. High pressure shows that ridge stretching all the way up into the Arctic Ocean and then dropping southward quickly across the west coast. This is draining all of that Arctic cold into the lower 48 while trying to stabilize things across south central and the southwestern coast. This is also dragging up that warm, wet Pacific air across the west, keeping rain and temperatures well above freezing across the west and allowing that cold air to stay in place across southeast. So a very interesting situation right here. At 9,000 feet, high pressures in charge across south central. Winds are picking up across the uh, Brooks Range, especially point south, anywhere from 40 to 50 knots here at 9,000 feet. And that northwesterly flow is coming across southeast. Another area of low pressure. There's uh, 
south of the eastern Aleutians, keeping the winds going strong. Turbulence and storm force winds at the surface there should be expected across the central and eastern islands. At 3,000 feet, a similar pattern here. Light winds across southeast. Winds picking up across the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range. And here's our stronger flow coming in from the west and southwest over the Arctic coast. So at 3,000 feet, places like uh, Cape Lisburn up to Point Lay, um, Barrow, and perhaps out toward Kaktovik, we'll be seeing some chop and turbulence at this uh, altitude here. 3,000 feet between 25 and 50 knots there on that uh, that wave coming across the Chukchi Sea coast and more of a northwesterly flow uh, a little bit stronger there across the higher terrain and then wind speeds just die off as they move into the eastern parts of the Gulf anywhere from about 5 to 15 knots. That's all feeding into that area of low pressure there south of the eastern Aleutians with some of the stronger winds coming in uh, with that next wave across the western Aleutians. You can see some speed differences there between 20 and 50 knots across the central and western parts of the chain. So turbulence, absolutely. Like today, we were seeing some uh, pretty uh, good opportunities for chop, not to mention mountain waves across the Brooks Range and across the interior, especially below 4,000 feet and below 6,000 feet across the uh, western parts of the Alaska Range and into the Alaska Peninsula itself. Flying weather looks great across southeast and south central and the Copper River Basin, so no matter where you're going tomorrow, do it carefully and check the weather before you go. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back with your marine weather here in just a few minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Cornfield. On behalf of the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation and Alaska Public Media, welcome to another edition of Hangar Flying. I've asked uh, Alaska Wing Commander Colonel Doug Statz back to finish our discussion. Last time we talked about the Civil Air Patrol in Alaska. Um, welcome back to Hangar Flying. Thank you. Uh, we started. We, we finished off with some statistics last time. So tell us the statistics about the Civil Air Patrol. How many flights? Um, many hours, searches, things like that. Just give me kind of, a, give us a brief rundown. Well, in the last fiscal year, we run the same fiscal year as the, as the U.S. government. Um, we flew uh, in total airplane hours about 2,700 hours uh, in the entire wing, of which 500 and some of those were actual search and rescue missions, combination of ELTs, missing aircraft, that sort of thing, which is, uh, in terms of CEP in the U.S., a much higher percentage than is typical uh, for the rest of the country. So. Uh, we, uh, let's see, we fly a lot more search and rescue hours than a, than a typical uh, wing in the lower 48. So we, uh, we have 28 powered aircraft and three gliders and 18 squadrons around the states, uh, one of which is a cadet squadron, so it doesn't have uh, necessarily an airplane assigned to it. But we um, have roughly 600 senior members and roughly 200 cadets. That, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that people probably have a misconception about CAP, and particularly if you want to join CAP, is that you have to be a pilot. And as it turns out, when I was looking at the numbers today, it turns out that only about 10% of our senior members are actually uh, qualified to fly CAP airplanes. So it's it's an organization just like any flying organization. There's a lot of support people required. So we're always looking for people that want to do uh, not necessarily be in the pilot seat, but fly as an observer or a scanner. Those we can't go out and do a mission without those people. So um, it's not just the pilot. The pilot's just there driving the bus to get the people where they mm -hmm. need to go to search if that's what they're doing. Um, but uh, we always always are looking for members that have administrative capabilities, uh, logistics, all kinds of specialties it takes to, to run a flying organization. So mm -hmm. don't let not being a pilot keep you from joining CAP. Oh, good advice. Now you, uh, we have time for your short story. You were actually on the other side of the fence to where you were be, you were rescued at one point. So uh, talk about your experience uh, having having somebody looking for you as uh, you know to be rescued. Well, back in 2000, um, I was in a helicopter coming back from a, a Coast Guard repeater site outside of Dillingham, and we got into some flat light, and it was dusky and um, light snow just turned into you know the, what people, most people refer to as whiteout conditions. And uh, we tried to turn towards, and this was in a helicopter, um, we tried to turn towards what we thought would be better ground reference visibility, and that didn't work out. Um, so we, uh, at just moments before the crash, we were in a 45 degree bank with the nose down, and the pilot um, was uh, competent enough and experienced enough to know to roll the, roll the, the uh, bank out and then uh, try and pull up, but uh, I'll, the sound I'll always remember is those rotors biting for air, but it was <laughs> a little too late. So we uh, we hit the ground and, and lots of parts of the helicopter came off and 
all the windows came out. But uh, when we came to rest, it, we were both relatively uninjured. So um, that was certainly fortunate for us. But we were 25 miles from Dillingham, and um, it was uh, an experience you don't want to repeat. And how long did it take for until so somebody came and uh, got you? Well, it turns out we actually, this happened about 8 o'clock at night, and we were actually rescued by about midnight. Hmm. Um, it turns out if I stood and held my mouth just right with my cell phone, I could get a hold of uh, uh, Prince, or excuse me, uh, Bristol Bay Search and Rescue, and or 911, and they uh, got a what they called a hasty team out of Manicotic to uh, snow machine out to get us, and they were quite amazed when they showed up looking at the aircraft that we survived. But uh, it uh, turned out well. But luckily, we we spent all day on a mountain. We were all dressed for. Uh, Arctic conditions were not or little sub-Arctic conditions, so um, we were very well equipped after the crash to to take care of ourselves out there if we hadn't been found that mm -hmm. quickly. So that brings up another point. I was going to ask you a question, which I ask everybody: If you had three things to bring with you in an airplane that for survival, uh, what would they be? Well, today uh, I think the first would be some sort of a signaling device like a PLB. Um, Personal locator beacon. Right, and mm -hmm. back in back in that time frame, uh, the PLBs didn't exist. The 406 ELT um, system didn't exist, so um, it, there was no way to just automatically signal where we were. It turns out our ELT did go off, but um, the weather was at that time too bad to fly anything. Somebody tried to come out behind us, but it was the weather was too bad. But uh, a signaling device in today's world that can pinpoint your location is a, is a huge help. Um, and the 406 beacons um, that you're, you optionally have in your aircraft today. The United States doesn't require a 406 ELT at this point in time. You can still go around with your 121.5, but it's, uh, your chances of getting found in an expeditious um, time frame is much, much lower with a 121.5 ELT. So uh, that would be a second thing to at least have on your aircraft, even if it's not on your person. And then what you need to make yourself some shelter and generate some heat are the, uh, the two big things. As, as uh, some of our CEP people are fond of saying, what you have on your person is what's your survival gear and what you have in the back is your camping gear. Uh, and that's, that's a good point. And stuff your pockets with all the things you need so they're with you when you need them. So. That's right. In that helicopter crash, there were a number of things that uh, were in the aircraft that we couldn't get to because it was yeah. rolled over on that side and we couldn't turn the helicopter over. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Hangar Flying. and. Um, Hope to get you back another time uh, in the future. So, uh, folks, um, thanks for joining and fly safe out there. All right, here's a look at today's sea ice edge. After talking to the sea ice forecasters today, and you can always uh, check their latest information at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice, you'll notice that hole in the Chukchi sea ice there north of the Bering Strait. Chances are after this weather pattern relents somewhat, a lot of this water out here is primed to flash freeze. So look for some rapid changes there after we move out of this very warm and wet pattern across the west coast. But for now, you can see there are certainly some very large areas of open water. In the meantime, shore fast ice is built in across the Kotzebue Sound area, Norton Sound, and across the YK Delta into Bristol Bay, and also some areas of ice forming across the northern parts of the Cook Inlet. So a lot of changes happening this time of the year. And again, you can keep track of those changes and the five-day outlook and forecast there anytime on our Sea Ice Program page. Across southeast, the winds should be letting up a little bit as we get into Saturday and Sunday. So look for some changes there in wind speed, but for the inner channels, this should be about right. Uh, 10, to, 10 knots or so from the north and northeast, variable flow a little bit farther south, two foot seas on the inside and a north and westerly flow that's remaining predominant throughout the rest of the weekend with five foot seas in most areas there on Saturday and more of a westerly push coming in on Sunday, but wind speeds stay about the same. You'll notice the inner channel is also holding on to more of a 10 knot flow. Uh, this becomes more of a south and southeasterly flow as we go ahead into Sunday. Still looking at relatively flat seas though. For Saturday in South Central, a variable flow around the northern parts of the Cook Inlet inside Prince William Sound and outside of Seward. They're more of a westerly flow outside of Prince William Sound. Relatively light winds there across the northern areas around the Barren Islands and Kamishak Bay Area and on either side of Kodiak Island. Wind speeds anywhere from 15 to 25 knots with a 12 foot sea uh, southeast of Kodiak. And that uh, continues but diminishes somewhat on Sunday with a 12 foot sea expected there inside Chelikov Strait. Wind speeds up to 20 knots with a 3 foot sea. Looking at 3 foot seas around the Barren Islands with more of an easterly flow, a variable flow 
uh, just south of uh, Kamishak Bay and outside and east of the Barren Islands. More of a north and easterly flow around Kenai and just uh, inside the Cook Inlet there. A variable flow up around the northern parts of the Cook Inlet and sea ice free waters. You're looking at seas around two feet or so. Around the Alaska Peninsula, a broad easterly flow with 25 to 35 knot winds coming across the peninsula. Six foot seas inside Bristol Bay, eight foot seas there a little bit farther south and more of an 18 foot sea outside of King Cove and Sand Point. Easterlies also around Chignik and Port Hyden. You're looking at Sunday now and 25 knot winds should prevail across all areas here. Five to six foot seas on the north side and 13 to 14 foot seas across the Pacific side as we end up the weekend. A north and easterly flow continues on Saturday. The strongest winds across the central and uh, east central Aleutians. Storm force winds are expected there tonight. Those should diminish somewhat on Saturday during the day. Uh, north and easterlies across on Alaska and Nikolsky with 13 to 14 foot seas there. Notice a southerly flow going across the west and west central islands from Kiska to Attu. 6 to 11 foot seas are expected to start the weekend. A little bit of a shift as the winds kind of float around underneath that ridge of high pressure that's sitting right about here. It's a very slender ridge, but again, it's going to allow those winds to kind of meander around a little bit. A 6 foot sea there closer to Kiska with a 20 knot wind and more of a southerly flow out around Shemya. Otherwise, north and easterly winds will continue for the central and eastern Aleutians to wrap up the weekend. The ridge is also kind of uh, playing around with the winds a little bit around the St. Matthew Island waters up to the St. Lawrence Island waters. A south and westerly flow there, a little bit farther south than that, Nunavak Island and the Pribilovs, more under the, the colder flow, wrapping around the low 20 to 30 knot winds with a 9 to 12 foot sea. And you can see more of an easterly flow coming offshore on Sunday, 15 to 20 knot winds across the northern parts of the Bering, a stronger easterly flow across the Pribilovs and out of the Kuskokwim Bay area with a 7 foot sea on Sunday. Now in the north, that southerly flow, again, uh, opening up the water there in the Chukchi Sea, 4 foot seas expected with a 15 to 20 knot wind, and easterly is coming across. Some of that is going to be pretty brisk again, so watch for areas of blowing snow in that. The winds shift course on Sunday, still looking fairly uh, brisk there, 30 to 35 knot winds, and ice continues there uh, north of Point Lay, but we still have that stronger southerly flow from Cape Lisburn southward into the Kotzebue Sound region. That's your marine forecast. Recapping tonight, winter storm warnings continue and freezing rain advisories continue for many parts of the interior. So make sure you check out the Fairbanks weather forecast by going to weather.gov slash Fairbanks or listening to your NOAA weather radio. A lot of these warnings and advisories will expire during the day on Saturday, starting very early in the morning and working their way westward. Watch for pockets of freezing rain and drizzle to continue in the interior with areas of fog in south central and rain across the west coast and more of the same on Sunday. Enjoy your weekend and be safe. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. It's never too early to set expectations and goals for your child's education. The UA College Savings Plan provides opportunities that can help you reach your educational savings goals. Save in Alaska. Study anywhere. There is more information available by calling 1-888, the number 4, and then Alaska. This message sponsored by the UA College Savings Plan.